I will very quickly um, give you a little bit of background and go into the session objectives. I have no disclosures as it relates to this technology. You're all familiar with this Rossi manuscript that clearly indicates that the prognostic impact of functional MR is not good and is dependent upon the severity of the mitral regurgitation. You're also familiar with the Duke database indicating that we generally just don't treat functional MR. If you look at all patients, this is 1,500 patients with echocardiographic evidence of three or four plus fMR and an ejection fraction over 20% in patients not undergoing coronary bypass surgery, slightly over 10% of the patients get treated. So this is severe MR, low ejection fraction. These are symptomatic patients. They don't get treated. So that really is the state of what the control population is. I also found this study very interesting. This is the Cleveland Clinic study in over 1,000 patients that have three or four plus MR, both functional and degenerative, treated before 2011. In the DMR patients, 85% get surgery. In the FMR patients, 36% get surgery. This is the Cleveland Clinic. This is what they do. They do surgery. And of the patients who had surgery, more than three quarters had it in the setting of coronary bypass surgery. So it was kind of a pass through in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. So two thirds of the patients get medical therapy, even at the Cleveland Clinic, when they have um, clinical heart failure and severe mitral regurgitation. And when you look at the prognosis of those untreated patients, you can see at five years, well, 50% are dead and 90% um, uh, have been either in the hospital or have died. And interestingly, when you look at those patients and review their echoes, more than a third had echoes that would have been eligible for things like the mitra clip. And frankly, if the cardio band were available, I would estimate that at least two thirds or more would be candidates for the cardio band. So it's an interesting opportunity in terms of how we might consider getting into the FMR space with a transcatheter technique. Um, this slide we came up with many years ago. It's now become um, as topical as it was. We're still struggling about repair versus replacement. Are they competitive? Are they complementary? And we'll continue, I think, to struggle with this. There aren't too many randomized trials to look at. This is probably the best. This is the CTSN Networks um, a study from Acker, the update recently published with the two-year outcomes. It's a fascinating study in many respects. I'm not going to go into the details. We don't have time. But the point was that repair and replacement were essentially equivalent as it relates to the primary endpoint at one year, which was median change in LVN systolic volume index. But there was a lot of recurrence in the repair, 33% uh, by a year, as you can see here. But even though there was that degree of recurrence of significant MR, there were no important changes in a lot of the clinical and other parameters that you look at, and certainly things like death and MACE, there were no differences. I would argue that maybe we can do better. I mean, we've always said we want to do a procedure that's like surgery. I think we began to start thinking that maybe we should consider the transcatheter procedures potentially can be better than surgery. And during the course of the next hour, we can talk about why this form of direct aneuploplasty potentially could be better than surgical repair. So we are going to focus on this one device, the cardioband system. It's a percutaneous transeptal supraannular adjustable aortic valve aneuploplasty ring, as you can see, as shown here. The advantages, potentially, we think, are that it is safe, safe, safe. Working in the atrium, we've learned from the mitral clip experience, is pretty safe in the hands of good operators. So it's a percutaneous transeptal access approach. It is a somewhat custom anatomical, surgical, or surgery-like aneuploplasty. There's bidirectional adjustability, so you're not going to over cinch and create gradients and mitral stenosis. It leaves open other transcatheter options. You can put a clip, you can put a valve. It doesn't really disturb the anatomy in such a way that you can't do other things, which I think is important in this era of a toolbox approach and sequential multiple different therapies that may be appropriate in many patients. And I think there's a really predictable, effective training program. Um, and we'll talk about that during the course of this morning. So the objectives of this session are to review some of the clinical controversies that we've been talking about in both mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, to discuss transcatheter treatment alternatives for MR and TR, but to focus on the cardioband, clinical use possibilities, procedural technical considerations, clinical results in the CE trial and single center experiences, the importance of echo guidance, physician training, and applications for tricuspid regurgitation. 
and talk a little bit about what the surgical standards are. Great. Thank you, Marty. And of course, Marty didn't save the superb faculty. Marty Leon also is here. And so welcome for surgeons. This is great, right? I've already started operating this early, so I'm, I'm kind of used to this early morning. Um, these are my um, disclosure statements. So obviously, everybody knows the mitral valve is very complex. Uh, and there's more to it than just aortic valve that we're used to. This video is not working, but you see a, a multitude of um, different parameters that are used uh, in order to fix the mitral valve. And as a surgeon, there must be 10 or 15 different ways uh, that I can fix the mitral valve. Um, and it's not just a replacement of the valve. So there's a lot of different things. And I think that CardioBand is going to become one of these many important tools that we're going to require in order to, um, to fix the mitral valve. So of course, there are different uh, types of, um, uh, of uh, mitral uh, regurgitation that was um, defined by Carpentier many years ago. Uh, and what we're talking about, you know, when, when you talk about degenerative mitral regurgitation, there's a variety of different spectrum. And we have a lot of tools to fix these. You can see uh, from, a, from a surgeon's point of view, we have a litany of different ways to fix these. We do cords, we do resection, uh, we do cords and resection. Um, there's uh, all these annuloplasty type of different things that we have. The spectrum for functional mitral regurgitation actually is less defined. Um, and for the most part, we have two therapies for it. Um, and there are newer ones coming up like papillary muscle slings. But for the most part, we use an asked annuloplasty ring um, a restrictive annuloplasty ring, or we use um, a mitral valve replacement. But really, the FMR is a disease of the left ventricle, not necessarily of the mitral valve. And really, is treatment for mitral regurgitation required? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you can see that when you have mitral regurgitation that's not fixed, really your mortality is, is staggering um, up to five years. Uh, you really see um, that it's almost worse than any cancer in the sense of a poor quality of life and also uh, how they do. So our surgeon's toolbox, for the most part, is annuloplasty or replacement for these patients. There's been some newer data from Japan uh, and actually a recently a randomized trial from Europe where we actually put these two papillary muscles together uh, and have uh, a ring in addition to papillary muscle relocation. But that's still uh, somewhat um, in, in evolution. And you can see here, we've gone a long way. We've gone from the first steps in 1968 to the class of ring, the physio ring, um, most commonly used is the physio, uh, physio 2 ring currently. And you can see the uh, uh, other um, uh, series of, of devices that have come on to either uh, market in Europe or uh, are coming to the United States. And you can see that potentially 2013, uh, when annuloplasty for a ring, the cardioband came into play, where that stands. So what's the surgical standard for FMR currently? We don't necessarily know the answer to that. We thought it was repaired by annuloplasty. That's what really, if you look at Mike Acker's paper from 2008, that's what he did. That's what I did in my own surgical practice. And, and uh, I see Tommy and I see Francesco, and that's what we did. We put a 28 size ring and we said, good luck, here you go. Um, obviously that has changed. Um, over time, but you can see also the repair by anaplasty is potentially the answer for the right patient. And especially when you look at uh, LVEDDs, uh, if they're less than 65 millimeters versus greater than 65 millimeters. So we as surgeons haven't done a great job with this, and that's really been uh, shown by Mike Acker's study that, that Marty just alluded to. So really replacement versus repair for functional MR, really in dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy, is it really the same? And I think that really if the repair can be done, if there's a depth of less than one, the tinting area is less than two and a half, their LVEDD is less than 65, and there are other criteria. If not, they go to or it's a replacement. And if they're intermediate or high risk patients and the STS greater than four, frail, aged, maybe repair is done if there's a simple repair, if you're just going to put an annuloplasty ring. But if you're going to start doing papillary muscle relocation and a ring and they have a multitude of comorbidities, then most surgeons are going to replace those patients. Um, I was a part of the CTSN trial when we did this uh, study, and it was quite interesting. And this is one of the few studies that's actually randomized, um, randomized trials. And we finally have shown that surgeons can actually randomize surgical patients. But there was no clinical difference between repair and replacement. There was clearly, and Marty showed you this, less recurrent MR uh, with the replacement. And there was no, uh, however, the problem was that there were no repair parameters used in the randomization process. So for me, I was told, repair whatever you want to do replace however you want to do it. Just make sure it's chordal sparing if you replace the valve. We didn't have very good repair um, algorithm when we did this trial. So, so the standard is in current surgical therapies, repair by restrictive annuloplasty or replacement according to the patient's conditions. 
Before the network trial, the repair rates were about 80 to 90 percent in FMR. Following the CTSN trial, we'll see what the repairs are going to be. I'm actually looking at the SDS database pre and post the NIS trial, so we're going to really see what the repair rates have changed over time. And you can see here, right now, uh, the uh, surgical repair versus replacement is really decided per patient. So uh, there are some European guidelines as far as EF goes. Class 1 is a recommendation if they're surgically repaired, uh, if they have an EF greater than 30 percent coronary bypass. If not, it's a Class 2B recommendation. So there are some um, uh, comparisons to surgery as far as comparing cardioband in a Physio 2 aneoplasty ring, and the results have a similar effect. Um, and there's a huge interventional toolbox of which really uh, you can see it's going to come down once those, pe those uh, companies that have CE marking evolution. So of course, these are the different uh, pathways that we're going to talk about. Today we're going to concentrate on the direct annuoplasty. So the advantages are using 40 years of surgical experience and data for the um, interventional arm, controlling the septolateral diameter and coaptation. And I agree with Marty, I think this is probably one of the, the major impacts that CardiBand potentially has, is that we're keeping all the options open for the patient for future replacement percutaneously, for future repair, surgically or percutaneously, and other technologies that can require, if it can go across the uh, mitral valve. So anaplasty is the basic element. Most common surgical treatment uh, is currently still that. The, uh, is aneoplasty um, uh, repair. The biggest difference is this is performed from, from femoral vein axis, which makes it extremely safe. So aneoplasty uh, for controlling the septolateral diameter and coaptation becomes uh, very important, and that's really what this allows you to do. So you can take a patient who has um, a uh, cardio band, which looks very similar uh, to what we do as a surgical approach. So keeping all the options are important. Uh, from replacement uh, support of the valve uh, in the ring, the repair or valve for a clip. So it says I have one uh, minute, so maybe I'll just go to the next one. And I think you're going to see some examples uh, of how this is performed. Uh, and I think Marty's going to show some of the results. So really, uh, percutaneous mitral valve summary really is that the mitral direct annuoplasty ring is like surgery as much as we have had so far. It's feasible, it's reproducible, it reduces MR and has a potential to achieve surgical-like MR reduction over time and has the potential to become the first-line option for high-risk patients, maybe even low-risk patients, and it preserves future clinical options. So I think it's a step towards surgical standard without open surgery or even I do a lot of minimally invasive surgery. Maybe we start off with this from a femoral vein access and then move forward to more aggressive therapies if necessary. Thank you very much. The 12 month results from CardioBand that led to the CE approval, um, my major disclaimer is that I'm really representing many other people, including Francesco, who's really the king of this um, and really got this study started and deserves so much of the credit. People like Michael Mack and others who've been closer to this technology. Um, but nevertheless, I will present the study and hopefully we can address some of the issues. This is a multi-center prospective evaluation that was used for CE approval of the cardio band. As you can see, it involves multiple, seven different centers, one in Israel, three in Germany, Zurich, Bichat, and Milan. So it's a, it's a wide distribution of centers and we're talking about 50 cases. And this represents also the early learning experience. So these are all inclusive, a continuous series of patients. The inclusion criteria are fairly straightforward. Patients had to be symptomatic. They had to have an EF of greater than 25% and an LVEDD of less than 70 and had to be so-called high risk to undergo mitral valve surgery with moderate or severe uh, functional MR. Some of the exclusion criteria, I'm not going to review all of them. Um, certainly a heavily calcified annulus wouldn't be attractive. Pulmonary hypertension of a certain degree was felt not to be a good indication early on. Right-sided heart failure was another. Uh, so those are some of the major uh, exclusion criteria. The primary endpoints of safety and performance, when you're dealing with a 50 patient registry, there's just so much that you can learn in terms of endpoints. You try to make sure that your procedure is safe. You try to um, be certain that you have some objective clinical and anatomic criteria that indicates the device is performing in a manner that it's supposed to. So they did have safety parameters. We won't, we won't go into what major serious adverse events means. We'll actually discuss them. And uh, they had a, a series of performance criteria, including the ability to reduce MR, 
um, and looking at severity over time, a change in other clinical parameters such as six-minute walk tests and um, quality of life assessments as well. So you know, the standard parameters that you look at, but remember it's only a 50-patient registry. The mean age of the patients was over 70 with a significant male predominance with a Euroscore 2 um, average of 7.5%. 84% .5%. Uh, were functional class 304. So these were very um, symptomatic patients with a predominance of ischemic versus non-ischemic functional MR with an average LVEDD of 61 and an average ejection fraction of 33% and multiple comorbidities. This is not a simple population that was treated. These are some of the safety events I want to again emphasize. This is the early experience. There were two deaths, one with a hemorrhagic stroke and one that needed elective mitral operation and died as a consequence of that. There was one TIA, there was one major bleeding complication, a few episodes of renal insufficiency and one episode of cardiac tamponade. This is the MR reduction over time, and we have core lab data, and Paul Grayburn was the core lab, and he could speak much more eloquently about these data than I can, certainly. Um, but you can see the predominance of patients had three or four plus MR to start with, and at, by discharge, it was down to close to 10% and did not change very much over time, at least in the data that we have, both paired data and the complete data set that is available. Um, uh, there still is two plus MR in as many as 40% of patients, and that number remains pretty stable over a period of time. But zero to one plus in 60% of the patients, um, and that remained uh, with, there's, there's only 10 patients out 24 months, but 25 patients out at a year, so that is encouraging from the standpoint of recurrence. Now, when we look at the MR, we also look to see if the device does what it's supposed to do, which is, which is reduction in, in the septolateral or AP dimension. And I like the point-to-point -point data because you can see a certain level of consistency in reduction of the septolateral dimension with an overall 30% average reduction in AP uh, dimension, um, which is very, very impressive. So consistent and impressive and also durable. Discharge, 30 days, 6 months, 12 months, does not change very much in terms of the overall septolateral dimension, which is, again, encouraging. Early data, but encouraging. Now, this is not a randomized trial. There's no blinding, so it's a little bit hard to assess some of the functional parameters, but everything is going in the right direction. Six-minute walk tests, quality of life assessments, neurocard association class, certainly at six months, show evidence of significant improvement. That is maintained at 12 months. And we have a little data at 24 months. Uh, that uh, you know, indicates that this is doing fairly well. The average increase in the six-minute walk test is close to 75 meters, and that's not trivial. Now, this is not a randomized trial, but that's at the level of what CRT does. Um, anything more than 50 is certainly significant. There is a um, uh, EU post-marketing trial that is now ongoing. It's for ischemic and non-ischemic FMR that's severe in patients that are symptomatic, class three or greater. Uh, with an ejection fraction of greater than 20% and without significant right heart failure, with a primary endpoint is a one-grade reduction in MR with a variety of secondary clinical endpoints as shown here, which is an additional 50-patient study in 20 centers, uh, uh, certainly Germany and possibly Italy and Switzerland. And now we're going to go on our recruiting campaign because um, there's going to be a U.S. clinical trial, and we hope that many of the people in this room would consider themselves as potential sites. So this is ischemic and non-ischemic uh, FMR in patients that are symptomatic with an EF of greater than 25%. Uh, the control arm here is going to be optimal standard of care. You know, we can spend a long time discussing that. Um, it is going to be a randomized trial. This is um, a study that um, ultimately will be, be presented to the FDA. It is not going to be a co-apt clone study. It'll be a different trial design than COAP with a composite clinical endpoint. Um, also, um, certainly having to, in addition, demonstrate significant reduction in MR with an estimated trial size of about 400 patients. So I, I think that you know, these data demonstrate that transcatheter surgical aneuplasty is feasible that the safety profile, it's only 50 patients, but it's encouraging, especially since it's the early learning experience, seems to be equivalent to other transcatheter procedures that operate from an atrial vantage point. Significant, consistent reduction in septolateral dimensions, significant, consistent reduction in mitral regurgitation, 
And the nice thing is that it does leave options open for the future in terms of being able to work around this ring in terms of either mitral clip or replacement or whatever in those patients that don't achieve either the anatomic or clinical benefits that we would like to see. Dear Marty, dear chairs, uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I want to share with you some, some experience data on the Veltec cardio band that we achieved within the last six months. So this is my disclosures. Uh, when we talk about mitral valve regurgitation, we've seen the first talk that we have to clearly differentiate between degenerative and functional disease. Functional disease being a very predominant disease in Europe, and we've seen that in the German Heart Report in 2015 that the prevalence of patients aged 80 plus has increased from 2000 to 2014 by 93 percent. So there's a huge uh, patient load. Also in the German Heart Report 2015, the number of percutaneous therapies being in the Alfieri edge-to-edge -edge therapy and annuloplasty has passed surgical uh, repair volume in Germany for the first time ever. So what are the different approaches uh, to the mitral valve in this disease? So we have possibility of a stitching technique, of ventricular remodeling, not all very successful. We have the Voltec um, approach, which is a direct analplasty, and we have a CE-marked um, coronary sinus approach. So just to give you an idea about the possibilities that we have in visualization and planning of these procedures, you can see here in these uh, three different aspects that we, of course, have to use CT planning in order to elucidate both hinge points, coronary sinus location, and circumflex artery, but it's also very important to have excellent image data throughout the procedure, as you can see in the upper left. We do in mind for all patients a CT pre-planning and a CT post-procedural control with those patients. And as you can see in the lower part, you get an excellent alignment of all different anchoring screws, which replace the sutures surgeons would normally do in these procedures. You can also see in this slide here the effect of chinching, which is traumatic from the upper part. And you've already learned that the chinching effect is about 25 to 35 percent uh, in these patients using a percutaneous technique, which very nicely approaches actually surgical results. On the upper right side, you see the control of a patient with a CRTD system. And of course, there is no involvement of the CRTD system within the coronary sinus and the direct analoplasty. And we're also able to achieve very excellent results, putting patients down to mild or trace MR with CardiBand alone. Sorry, Marty, that I have to replace the slide a little bit because you left mines out and I just want to give you a slight overview over the European experience there. So we achieved to do seven procedures, one of which is within the CE study uh, within the last six months. You already heard that the device has an excellent safety profile. And that's what we also can report about the device and that the efficacy in reducing septal lateral dimension and AP dimension is dramatic. So what about our single center experience? We treated seven patients with an age range of 47 with non-compaction cardiomyopathy up to 87 years of age. One was a CE study patient. Six patients up to now are treated with cardioband analoplasty only. 14 to 16 anchors were implanted in each patient. One patient this week, actually three hours before I took my plane to Chicago, uh, received a combination of a cardioband procedure with a planned mitroclip and T implant this week. Six patients could be directed and corrected directly down to an MR reduction down to one grade one or one to one. One patient had an incomplete posterior anchoring. There were no safety issues whatsoever. And the device time within this short learning period was down from four hours to 2.5 hours uh, implant time. So the basic aspects of this cardioband procedure, it's a pure venous procedure. We have a transeptal puncture that we use with the mitroclip procedure, a transeptal sheath positioning, an Ironman going into the left ventricle for the commissural hinge point guide catheter positioning via the LAA, and then a continuous anchor positioning of 14 to 16 anchors using advanced three-dimensional echocardiography with multi-planar reconstruction 
final chinching and MR assessment under natural hemodynamic conditions. So just to give you one patient example of our patients, you can nicely see that we have a patient with a combination of an impaired LV function and a huge LA dimension. This patient has a 140cc uh, atrium, so it's far above the cutoff value of 34cc per square meter. And you can nicely see that we have regurgitation into the right pulmonary veins. So what is important to detect and what is the difference to surgical approaches is that we have to respect annular motion of the mitral annulus. And this is something we can elucidate from three-dimensional analysis of the mitral ring. And there's a recent work actually from California comparing rigid analplasty, mitral valve replacement, and mitral clip repair in patients and looking for basal contraction and annular motion. And of course, the only procedure that pre prevents uh, a deterioration of basal contraction, giving as a wall motion score index, and preserves annular motion are percutaneous techniques with flexible systems like the mitroclip system or analoplasties using flexible rings. So we have to ask ourselves whether the rigid solution is the only solution in these patients. So coming back to this patient, you see this is a severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, you start with a transeptal puncture, which is pretty much similar to the um, mitroclip experience. It's a little bit lower puncture that is about one centimeter lower to the mitral valve uh, because we're treating the annulus than the mitroclip experience. You can nicely see that in three-dimensional echo, you can easily control even your wires. This is just a wire position in the left upper pulmonary vein. You then can also detect, of course, your Ironman, which goes into the, across the mitral valve into the ventricle. You can control this in 3D, as you can see here. This is a very thin Ironman catheter in three-dimensional echo. You position yourself next to the hinge point, and here you can see that we're easily able to see the coronary arteries, the, the um, um, coronary sinus. We see the hinge point here. The catheter is too much into the mitral leaflets, so you will reposition this catheter by about three millimeter to the outside, and then you will start anchoring. This control has been done by three-dimensional echo, as seen here. This is an aniplane adjustment, which corrects automatically for the, um, for the anatomic position uh, of the mitral, mitral valve annulus. We then go on to deploy the different anchors, the first three anchors being most uh, important uh, for the security of the system. You can see we're anchoring with a multiplanar reconstruction at each point, and I want to make sure that you see the anchoring points here, and you see each of the anchors definitely in three-dimensional echo throughout the procedure. And you can also control for coronary sinus and vessels, which is seen here. So it's a very easy and it's a very, very good controlled procedure if you use three-dimensional echo. You see a complete ring situation here, encompassing about 75 to 80 percent of the ring anatomy, of course, leaving out the aortic root. This is the result. You see the chinching process, which is also dynamically controlled under three-dimensional echo with black and white images and color images. And you see in fluoro the chinching effect over time. You can chinch these devices between 2.5 to 5.5 centimeters. And another aspect that's very important in these patients is that you don't produce stenosis. So the gradients of these patients are extremely low. They range from 0.8 to 2 millimeters of mercury, a distinct variation to the Alfieri edge-to-edge -edge stitch experience. And you see that these results are excellent over time. So this is a pure cardio band procedure with zero MR after the procedure. There are also some new approaches, and this Wednesday, just prior to taking the plane, which was some adrenal stress for me, uh, I did the combination of a cardio band and a mitroclip NT system, which is implanted uh, first in man in Mainz on Wednesday. And you can see that this also produces excellent results. This was a patient with a 5.6 annulus dilatation. This patient was very young, 47 years, and he had a non-compaction cardiomyopathy, not qualifying him for a heart-made implant. And you can nicely see that you can easily control this, both in fluoro and echo, three-dimensionally, do the grasping process three-dimensionally. You put in two clips, and you see we get an excellent result 
of trace MR after this procedure. So my take home messages are, as with Marty, percutaneous direct analplasty is feasible. It's a safe procedure with a steep and fast learning curve. CT planning of the procedure is vital. We need to look for the landing zone, size, circumflex anatomy, coronary sinus. 3D echo and echo quality is pivotal and vital for, and allows for direct virtual control throughout the procedure. MPR flexi slides or multiplanar reconstruction like in CT allow us to control position and angulation for each anchor live during the procedure. Chinching effect and alfieri technique can be combined in severe dilatation in a surgical-like approach. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Ralph, that was a great presentation, and I'm so sorry that I left Mainz out of that slide. It was not intentional. <laughs> so, Vino, this is a uh, incomplete, flexible annuloplasty ring. Is that is that heresy? You know, from a surgical standpoint, are the surgeons you know, going to cringe and say, "What are you doing?" So, you know, quite honestly, that that is not the standard. Some of the echo insights and try to explain some of the observations that we're seeing. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thanks, Marty. So, um, talk a little bit about this uh, echo guidance and anatomy and physiology disclosures. Uh, you've seen the procedural steps; uh, pretty straightforward: transeptal puncture, then putting the um, system in. And then, uh, as you saw uh, from Stefan's talk, you implant these um, uh, anchors. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of that. And then the last uh, step, once the anchors are all implanted, is to put in the cinching tool and cinch this up. Uh, you know, regarding the last comments by, by Vino, I think the difference here is that this is a physiologic repair. The surgeons are limited to doing an anatomic repair because you, you're, there's no volume and no pressure in the heart. Uh, it stopped, and so you're doing an anatomic repair. You're using a sizing device. This allows you to actually size the annuloplasty in motion in a beating heart, and I think maybe that difference between a physiologic and an anatomic repair may turn out to be why this works so well. I think everybody knows how to do a transeptal puncture, but these slides uh, are really good because they show, you know, a, a, a 40 or a, a CT image on the left and the SVC, IVC, that uh, blue line there represents the bicaval view so we can really see if we're caudal or cranial uh, in, in the fossa. Uh, by looking at the echo there, uh, we can then switch to a short axis view which really cuts through the aorta there and lets us get uh, more posterior. There's a tendency for the needle uh, to want to go this way and you'd really except in a few circumstances, don't want to go there. Uh, and then, of course, the four-chamber view cuts more or less this way through the CT scan and allows us to look at, this is more for the mitroclip, look at the height. Uh, but the, after we do the transeptal puncture, and you've seen this, the next step in the echo guidance is really to, to put these anchors. And when one looks at the 3D, you can see right here, you beautifully see the annulus. Uh, you can actually see the lateral and the medial uh, trigones here, you're really going to aim for the lateral trigone to start. And not only do you use 3D, but as you've just seen, you use the 2D as well to make sure you're not putting your anchor through the leaflet or too far behind the actual annulus. And I've seen all these echoes from all of these implants, and the t whoever's guiding this by TE, every single one of these guys is doing a fabulous job. Uh, and. Uh, so then, then the anchor goes in here, and this is basically a six millimeter long screw uh, that goes in. And this is just an example of watching the screw go in. So this is the first anchor uh, going into the lateral trigone. Uh, it's really not hard to do. You'd basically make 10 turns with your right hand on the screw. It goes in, and you tug on it to make sure it's good, and then you, you release it. So this is sort of just a quick uh, show of that. This is the same image I showed you in motion of the first uh, anchor going in, and typically you're going to put, you know, 12 to 16 of these in, depending on the size of the annulus, uh, which is determined by CT scan, and then one begins to cinch. And so you can see where it's, it looks like this at the start. Uh, you begin the cinching process, and you can see this uh, taking shape here, and then this is sort of the final uh, version of it, and if you compare 
section B to section D here, you can really see how you've cinched this up uh, in real time while you're looking at the MR on TEE. Uh, this is just a, the, I showed you a still frame of this. This is the moving picture of the first anchor going in. Again, you, you really see exactly where you're going. This is the final anchor uh, right here. And there, are, uh, in this case, are, are 16, uh, one centimeter apart going all the way across here. So um, this is after cinching, and you can see the change in it. Now, one of the things I, I want you to look at, because I, I think it may be important, and I'll show it to you again on some 3D reconstructions, is this is not a perfect horseshoe or U-shape. It's a little bit flatter here. And I was not anticipating this or predicting this when you're cinching from the lateral trigone, but it tends to pull up P3. You, you can see that. Vino, you see yeah, that, right? Yeah, I see that. It's pulling up P3, which is exactly what you want to do in ischemic functional MR. And I was surprised to see that. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so uh, again, baseline on the left, you see this huge dilated annulus. Really now in the middle, you see the device pre-cinching. The device is nice and stable inside the annulus, but it hasn't really changed it. And then on the right, after cinching, you've dramatically shortened uh, the annulus and created this sort of pulling up of P3. And so we did 3D reconstructions on the images that we were able to get. Uh, you know, technically it has to come in as a full volume set from the machine so that we can analyze it on the TomTech device. And, and you can see really the coaptation uh, line here on 3D is pretty flat with a very huge annulus at baseline. And then this coaptation line you know, curves up nicely afterwards and, and is flatter on this P3 side over here. Uh, so we did these 3D analysis. You, we, we were able to measure not in 2D, but in 3D space. We could measure the uh, change in the uh, AP, or, or also known as the septal lateral, and the uh, intercommissural, we, uh, the circumference. We measured all these things. We measured the aorta mitral angle. And then uh, we actually, uh, this is just an observational study in a, sm a subset of these 50 patients. 22 had these full volume sets that we could analyze. But if you look uh, pre and post, a lot, of the ch a lot of these things change statistically significantly, as you would expect. Bonferroni would roll over in his grave with these multiple comparisons. So our <laughs> statisticians insisted correctly that we correct these p-values, and when we do the Bonferroni correction, you know, four things fall out, which is intercommissural diameter, AP diameter, annular circumference, and the aortic mitral angle all change significantly, and that'll be coming out in September in AJC. But so I got asked to talk about how quick you can master cardioband, which is my conflicts of interest. Uh, just to give you some background, I'm an interventional cardiologist, I live in Milan, and I was trying to think about why they asked me to present, and probably the reason being was that I learned to do cardioband before I learned to do clip. And so they figured if they could teach me to do cardioband, probably most of you could learn cardioband too. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm being used as a bad example, but it's, it's important to know when you're being used. Um, so I've done been involved in the early stages with Francesco, watched him develop the therapy, uh, but it really is a procedure you have to learn being a first operator. And so I've done now six cases as a first operator, and I want to share some of those cases with you. But really, I want to take you through how I learned CardioBand, because I do believe it's very hands-on learning. <clears throat> This is definitely a theoretical part, and the company now does have a step-to-step -step guidance, and I'll show you a little bit of, of that, of how you move the device to get around the annulus. What's really impressed me has been, has been the hands-on training, because it doesn't involve animals. It involves a benchtop model, which you can see over here. You can place a TE probe into it, and you put it un, under your, uh, your fluoroscopy. So you, in the cath lab, you try and simulate a cardio band procedure. And it actually works pretty well because you use, you use the two modalities that you would use during a procedure. You use the fluoroscopy to guide yourself and to see the navigation, uh, to see the actual anchors going into the tissue, and you use 3D echocardiography. Uh, and the 3D echocardiography on this model, uh, they have the leaflets moving, it's actually pretty impressive. So, you know, I often will do, did my practice, not even with our senior echocardiographer, but one of our echo fellows would, sp would sit there and would spend a couple of hours just trying to be sure that we understood how to navigate from P1 to, P to P3. 
I'll show you just another view. Um, and so you do the entire procedure as you would in the patient, but on the bench. And you can do this as many times as you want. And the bonus is you also get to see at the end what, what it looks like and whether you did a good job or not. So that's really the first part of the training. And it usually takes about an hour to, to do this on a model. Um, and in my first couple of cases, I was actually pretty insistent. I had them come for the first three cases every single time the day before. And I said, let's do it again on the model. I want to be ready and really understand the procedure before I do it the next day. I think what's been made it really predictable is the fact that we now can tell an operator, an operator can understand exactly what the different parts of the device do. So it may look pretty complex in the beginning, you know, because there's a transeptal sheet, there's a guiding catheter, there's an implant delivery system, the three move slightly independently of each other, but I think the movements are now fairly, fairly predictable. And what we're able to do is to give a roadmap to a physician beforehand saying, okay, well, you're gonna start your procedure on the anterolateral commissure, and you're gonna to need to navigate around P1 implanting these anchors. And it's become pretty predictable where you can actually say that in 90% of cases, this is exactly what you can do step by step. So it'll be akin to flying a plane. You know, you could open a book, read it, and go step by step. If I follow those instructions, I should arrive from point A to point B. So. It's in essence, from going from around P1, you know, you use the transeptal sheath, you use some clockwise rotation, the plus and minus, maybe some plus and minus in the guiding catheter to move yourself closer, further away from the hinge point. As you move to P2, the movements become slightly different, but once again, fairly predictable movements in the sense that you can, you know beforehand more or less what you need to do to move along P2. Similarly, as we go to P3, the movements change again. You need to start hooking the guiding catheter and hooking the tips so, because you're coming really close to where you've done the transeptal puncture. But once again, fairly reproducible mo movements, which in most cases, that's all you do. There'll be other occasional cases where maybe because of visualization or because of the anatomy, you, mean, Nate, you, mean it, you may need to change this a little bit, but it's often really minor changes in the catheter. So I think the other thing that really makes this procedure successful, other than the device being successful and very predictable, is, is the procedural support. So I did all these six cases with Tomer, uh, one of the Valtech engineers, and I say his name because I want to give him credit. Uh, I think I wouldn't have been successful in these cases without having really good clinical support next to me. Um, I really do think you don't need physician proctors for these cases, but non-physician proctors work really well. They know the device extremely well, and they're following all the procedures. And just in case anybody asks, Francesco was not in the room when we did these cases. He was in another country. <laughs> um, <laughs> So very briefly, <laughs> uh, my single-use experience, um, I've done six cases as first operator. I thought I'd take you very quickly to through the, the five cases, last five cases that I've done, uh, starting last year. So this was the first one. I started around about April last year. Um, here you see the baseline post-contraction, a very good result for, I think it was my second case ever as a first operator. But unfortunately, trying to, it was still during the study, and we're getting towards the end of the study, and it was difficult and challenging to find the right patients. Uh, the device became commercial, and so the last four cases I've done have all been commercial cases. Um, and with increasingly different levels, increasing levels of difficulty and challenge. So I'm afraid that's not running extremely well, but I think here you see another successful case, a very ill patient with an aortic prosthesis. Um, we had a good, a good final result. In March, we did, then did another two cases, and for the sake of time, I'll take you through this very quickly. You can see about 16 anchors implanted here. You see really how the annulus in front of you dramatically changes as you perform the cinching, which does allow you to really optimize the result, make sure you're happy with the residual MR, look at the gradient, and if you're unhappy, you can actually then release some of the cinching if need be. So here's the result in this patient. I mean, we literally went from severe MR to zero MR. I mean, the patient actually did feel, you know, felt, felt remarkably different uh, afterwards and has gone back to a fairly normal lifestyle. Um, the cases have been going pretty successfully, so we decided to take on even more challenging anatomy. And for the sake of time, I can't show you this. We did a live in the box recently, about a month ago, with Valtech, uh, where we tried to take on you know, a slightly more challenging case. And I'll maybe 
just summarize the case, this is a 75-year-old patient who had two microclips put in for functional MR a year ago. Initial result looked pretty good, uh, but then he came back with residual uh, MR. I'll just maybe go forward. And this is what the MR looked like. So you saw really multiple jets between the clips and either side of the clip. And we didn't think this was really a good candidate to try and perform reclipping. We might have had to put three more clips in, really in order to get rid of this, of this result. So we thought we'd use CardioBan as a method of treating this recurrent MR and maybe in a sense having what, you know, with, what could be potentially a fully percutaneous repair. And this is the result afterwards, which I think is more than I would have expected with, re with repeat uh, microclips, so really a good result. The most recent case we did was from this week, uh, a couple of days just before leaving for Chicago. And again, a patient with multiple jets from annular dilatation, functional MR, uh, a procedure which took about just over two hours, two and a half hours. We implanted 15 anchors. And you'll see how at 3.5 centimeters of contraction, already the patient developed smoke in his left atrium. There was some residual MR. And we decided, you know what, we didn't want even residual mild MR. We wanted no MR and this was the final result. So really fantastic final result in this patient, and so far in the patients we've seen, the results have been very consistent. So I'd maybe like to summarize. I think you, know, you can learn CardioBand. There's extensive theoretical and practical training. If any of you want to try it while at TVT, uh, Valtech have been kind enough to set up a mobile cath lab outside in the parking lot where they have that system. So you can go try and implant a cardio band yourself with fluoroscopy and echo. I suggest going to try it and will give you a real sense of how difficult or easy uh, this device is. Uh, what's really made a difference for me has been the ex excellent clinical support. I mean, the support I get in the lab for, for a Valtech case, cardio band case, is incredible. The, pre-workup prep, as well as how well um, their staff know the device really does make a difference to the final result. Um, I think previous microclip experience is useful, definitely is. So if you've done it, I think you'll find it easier to learn this, but it's not mandatory. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to shift to the other uh, um, AV valve and talk a little bit about applications for TR. Thank you, Marty. So first of all, I learned that uh, prior to coming to TVT, a lot of people are doing a lot of procedures, so that's good. <laughs> uh, second, I was the first to do NT. You know that. <laughs> okay, whatever. All right, so um, I, I just give you a glimpse into the future. Uh, it's not so much future because uh, we're already collecting the patients and uh, should happen very soon. Uh, obviously, this any annuloplasty device, uh, which is a direct annuloplasty, has a potential to be implanted also on the, on the right side of the heart. This is not uh, uh, a uh, less important valve as we are starting to learn. And obviously there was a, um, there has been a, a, a thinking about uh, using the same technology on the right side. Uh, to go on the right side, on the other hand, uh, you need uh, a different delivery system. Uh, which is basically mirroring uh, the delivery system that we use for the mitral. Because uh, while uh, we put the anchors in, uh, uh, as you see here, in a counterclockwise fashion here, we start from the uh, uh, anterolateral commissure, we go to posterior medial commissure, we envision this procedure and we do this procedure in animals starting from the septo anterior commissure or anterior commissure and we go uh, towards the uh, coronary sinus going in, in, a, in a clockwise fashion. Uh, I think there is not much uh, to learn uh, other than imaging uh, in this procedure. Uh, from a technology standpoint, it's basically the same procedure. Uh, we're running an animal trial study. Also, I need to, st I need to say Maizano is not even present at the animal studies anymore. <laughs> because these studies are uh, actually run uh, mostly by uh, the uh, engineers at Valtech, which is uh, another important achievement in my opinion. This speaks uh, a lot about this, uh, how this company is serious and also involves the collaboration with a lot of uh, important people and particularly with Rebecca Han, which has been uh, recently involved also in, this, uh, in these trials. Uh, you see here, uh, the first ankle implantation 
I would say it has uh, exactly the same uh, concept as for, uh, for the mitral. Uh, the difference uh, will be how we image this. This will be a challenge. At the moment in the animals we're using a combination of uh, apicardial and, and uh, of uh, and, and, and on uh, intracardiac echo. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to image uh, the uh, tricuspid valve and this will be our main challenge when we go into, into, into humans. This is an uh, uh, example of uh, uh, this uh, 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 the first anchor implantation with a pull test pretty nice images. These are the anchors implanted before and after cinching. Here, again, in the tricuspid annulus. Different from the uh, mitral valve, the, on, the right, uh, on the right side we have the right coronary which goes all around the, the, uh, the annulus, so it's important to use a, a guiding wire to show, uh, to guide, uh, a visualization wire, I would say, into the right coronary to show that we are not uh, impinging into the into the coronary. You see here, after cinching control that shows that there is no effect. And what you see here is a tremendous reduction of the annular uh, dimensions. Obviously, the tricuspid annulus is a bit uh, less strong as the mitral. So as you see here, there is a huge reduction of the tricuspid annulus. And obviously, we can expect a huge effect on tricuspid insufficiency in these patients uh, where uh, Obviously, the component of dilatation is always uh, predominant uh, compared to the tethering. In a tricuspid space, uh, dilatation is always more important. So you see also, interestingly, here, uh, the increase of coaptation. These are measurements. Uh, these are some uh, uh, post-mortem examination showing how close this uh, to the leaflets, to the hinge of the leaflets is the, uh, the implant, which means uh, uh, with experienced operators, these are en experienced engineers, uh, you can do it. I, I've done a couple as well, but I think uh, uh, it's really reproducible as for the uh, mitral space. Uh, we have seen uh, tremendous changes in the uh, diameters and the valve area. This is really amazing we have a 50% decrease. So in conclusion, this technology is versatile, can be applied also on the right side of the heart. Uh, we will find out which will be the ideal candidate, but for sure what we are, uh, the, the challenge in the tricuspid space to date has been that uh, most of the devices we've been using uh, to date are devices which are designed for uh, mild to moderate associated tricuspid insufficiency. I think uh, Fortec is a great uh, device for uh, prevention. Uh, mitral line probably is also, triline is also tremendous for prevention. This probably is the right device to repair end stage TR, which is what we are treating today. So we're looking forward to do the first in men.